it's quite moving to have to talk about people you've admired and worked with uh, so much. Um, and uh, Hasmukh Bhai, always very dashing, handsome, coming on a stage with his, with his presence is still something which one, one, one sees um, all the time. In your list of institutions, there might be several you have forgotten, but one of them being the Vikram Sarabhai Community Science Center, of which he was also the chairman. And I had the good fortune of also working with him in, in uh, that capacity and many, many others. It's indeed a pleasure to, and an honor uh, to be here to, to deliver this talk. Can you hear me? It's a very low volume now. Maybe I can, I think it's better. Right. Uh, so members of Hasmukh Bhai's family, uh, several friends and colleagues here who I've, I've known and worked with in different capacities. Uh, Larry Saab, Samir Bhai, members of the Ecological um, Society, uh, and friends. Just before I came in, the press was asking me some questions. And um, I was saying how the challenge of environment today and the challenge before us is where you have uh, all these different stakeholders, whether they are government, uh, industry, NGO, civil society, all of these really need to work together in ways in which you can, you can progress this agenda. It is not possible to any, for any one of these to do it on their own because the problems are of that nature. And here was Hasmukh Bhai who was equally at home, whether it was in the Prime Minister's office or as the chairman of, of an industry or, or um, leading this and several other NGOs. Who, who in fact embodied that confluence of different stakes which we want. And someone who, was, who could move in from one to another uh, so easily. And that is in fact uh, where, we are, uh, where we are looking at this. I was asked what the talk should be and I said ecology of hope. Uh, hope is something which we cannot, in, in, in spite of all the dreadful projections, uh, we, cannot, we cannot forget hope. And um, I must say, yesterday I was, I was moved by two performances, two things in the evening yesterday. There was, um, uh, there was a show at Natrani, at Darpana, of um, a person who was paraplegic. He had um, only 10, um, what shall I say, vertebra, vertebrae, 10 vertebrae, uh, 10 or 11. And he said this partner who was dancing with her, he said she has 100. So he, as, as, a, as, a, as a gesture. So he called this program 111 and just demonstrated what could be done together. It was so moving and almost the audience were people from the uh, Apang Manav Mandir and they were cheering away. You know, there was more cheering there than in the football match which I saw a little later. But they were cheering away and, and it just shows what the human spirit uh, can, can really do. Uh, and it showed hope. It showed hope even in, the, even in the football final, because still the last minute, first half you thought that it's all over, and one was relaxing, and suddenly uh, uh, France came in and equalized it, and then, uh, then you had half time, and there again it got equalized. So, so the hope on both sides, and what human spirit can do, is what it's about. And Hasmungbhai really represented, represented that hope, represented that problems can be solved, and problems which we are not necessarily always so familiar with. We are talking about this wonderful book and the work of the Ecological Society in, uh, on the coastline. And um, as all of you know perhaps, uh, Gujarat has the longest coastline, 1600 kilometers of any state, in, any state in India. And yet we don't think like a coastal state. We, if you ask people in Gujarat, they, they don't, they're not coastal in mind. Of course, the people who live on the coast are. And I was asked this question, why is it, why is it not? And I said it could perhaps be that the principal city or the capital is not on the coast, unlike Bombay or Chennai or uh, Trivandrum or several others, which are on the coastline. And therefore, they, they people think of themselves as the coastline. Here, we are somehow insulated and don't, don't see 
the fact that we are in fact the largest coastal state. Uh, but it also shows how, how human minds are, are somewhat constricted by what, what they see and, and how, they, how they behave. And in fact, that has been one of the challenges that how do you open, how do you open that mind, mind up uh, in terms of anything. If you take in terms of sound, we are in fact hearing a very small set of wavelengths. Uh, and we would know. I have um, uh, once been in a situation like this where, the, where there was total darkness and the audience said, you please continue talking. So I did. When the light came up, I was happy to know that most of the audience was still there. <laughs> but but uh, I, I did keep, uh, keep talking. So if that happens again, we will do that. But I was talking about how the light spectrum which we see is, is so small. And if you want to see the several stars, we can only see it through an X-ray or, uh, or through some uh, other uh, thermal device. And that has limited us uh, in terms of what we perceive. But very big limitation is time. That we, we don't realize that what humans have managed to do in the last 250 years can in fact be so dramatically disturbing ecological balance. It's, it's really strange. Can I see the next slide? Okay. The, the main thing about ecology is, is that you study the relationship between living species and the, and the environment. And that is the relationship which has always been in balance. It just might be slight disruptions, but nature has a way of being robust and bringing it, bringing it back. But what humans have managed to do post the industrial revolution, when we suddenly had not only the resources of the planet as they are today, but through fossil fuels, we had like a savings account, someone suddenly giving you a key to a savings account which had endless, seemingly endless resources, and you could do what you like, and which is what they did. And we had the whole development of mostly Western countries and then you had not only the resources of your own but the resources of the colony colonies which you had so you had these these resources which you which you could do it and and we thought that surely we as humans could not have such an impact that the very foundation on which we are we are living will get will get disturbed but it has it has and there are people like Hasmukbai and others who have recognized it uh, much bef before. I remember when we started work, the word environment was really a fringe, fringe word. It was certainly not something which you found industries uh, uh, discussing. So that, that whole pristine nature of things, I often ask children, okay, what is it that doesn't exist here? What is it that you don't see? And uh, Few of them would come out with an answer saying that waste. There is, in fact, no concept of waste. It is, it is, uh, it is so circular that uh, that whatever becomes so-called output of one gets into the input of another, and that's how that balance was always maintained. Uh, in fact, our program with children is is called Rochaka, which is the opposite of Kacha Ro. And, and I, because I couldn't find a good word. I couldn't find a good word to, to show recycling in Gujarati. And I thought Rochak stands for something beautiful or good, and Kacharo doesn't. So I think that's how we, we started it. But how do you, how do you have a circular circularity of it? And that circularity was possible. Uh, so it was really, as I said, the discovery of the f fossil fuel, which, which gave unlimited unlimited power next one yeah. and and that industrial revolution now that revolution infected all of us it in fact you would say how does the handloom sector in india get affected by this because all the mills started they needed cotton and cotton from india had to go there made into cloth and sold back to us it's a whole it's another subject to talk about what happened in the colonial period but what happened to the environment was that these chimneys which used, which used to smoke, and smoke used to be at that time almost a signal of um, 
of wealth. You know, you could see Ahmedabad, I remember from our house, you could see a whole lot of signals, chimneys. I mean, there used to be about 60, 65 textile mills, out of which there are hardly one or two which, which are there, and that also with a very different technology. But, but that whole concept of growth, industry, where you wanted to go, all came out of, out of this. And along with this, the other thing which happened was that you had the discovery of medicines, penicillin, better hygiene, and that led to, that led to a complete change. Next. Uh, this is that same concept that I said, there is no such thing in nature as waste. Next one, please. So you see this uh, population curve. Uh, I have to revise this slide because when I do this slide, people are not sure whether we'll reach eight. But today we've just crossed, uh, just a few months ago, they said that the eighth billion child has come. And uh, my slides probably still say that India is not num necessarily the number one most populous country in the world. But I think in another few months, in another few months in 2023, we will see the newspaper headline which is saying now India is the most populous country. It's not necessarily a great thing to have, but that is the reality. And it will be that for many years to come, uh, that it will be the most populous. But here it was trying to project, but just see these, these hockey stick type of curves. And there are several such slides. You can see slides of energy use, you can see slides of waste production, you can see slides of urbanization. All of them start looking like this. Next one. We don't sometimes realize, just do one by one, it will just say, that perhaps the first uh, billion, these are all the next billions. If you see that um, the first billion maybe took 120, the second one took 124 years, which was 1927, relatively recently. When India became independent, it was still about two and a half billion was the population. So what we are talking about is in our lifestyle, in our life, at least my lifetime, that uh, 32 years to get the third one, 15 years to get the fourth billion, your fifth billion in 13 years, sixth in 12, seventh in 12, and the eighth billion was estimated in 13 years, in 2024, right? That was the estimate when this slide was made. It actually happened in 2022, in 11 years. So while we might think that we are slowing down, we in fact haven't. As I said, I just need a new set of slides to, to put together with this. But that is the pace. 11 years is, is really nothing. And to say that the entire 11 years is what? The entire planet, entire Indian population, every year and a half, every, every 10 years and a half, gets added to this planet. And, and that, is, that is really strange. I was, I was talking in Australia at a, at a Deacon lecture. And that morning, they had announced that um, they are doing the Australian census. And again, we are going to, I'm going to talk <laughs> in the dark, but uh, they were doing the Australian census. And I started, therefore, just by saying that you know that the entire population of Australia gets added to India every 13 months or so. Huh? And I said, if we want to have the same standard of living as you, then the number of hospitals you have, number of schools you have, the number of infrastructure you have would have to, even for the new population, would have to be built, the entire Australian infrastructure would have to be built every, every, every year and a half. So that was a, diff that was a huge, huge challenge. So now, is the population the only thing? The, and incidentally, it was interesting that the Deacon lecture uh, did not allow slides. Huh. So the, the speaker before me, he said, I'm going to use slides. And he would go and do this. Uh, there was no slide, actually. But he would make you imagine what that slide is. <laughs> and and I, I, might, I might need to do, do the same. But uh, oh, it's, it's starting here. Yeah. OK, next one. Let's go to the next one. Yeah. yeah so. We are talking about 1928. Gandhiji, much before all this debate and the word sustainability, he was talking to Ganshandas Birla. And this is a statement he said that God forbid that, in, no, this is not Ganshandas, this is 1920, this is this one, one, that India should ever take to industrialism after the manner of the West. West in that case usually meant England. 
if an entire nation of 300 million, we are now talking about one point, whatever, billion, 300 million took to similar economic exploitation, it would strip the world bare like locusts. Now, that realization of what lifestyles is and how you have to talk to lifestyle. Of course, Gandhiji was talking about frugality also. Today, we don't necessarily talk about frugality, we talk about smart lifestyles. Or we talk about ways in which we can have the same type of lifestyle, yet not have the type of footprint which it has. But this is how back Gandhiji's foresights really were. Next one. Uh, as far as the West is concerned, it was really this book of Rachel Carson in 62, called The Silent Spring, which is considered the watershed when it created that type of awareness. Uh, Silent Spring really spoke about how the, the eggs of the eagle uh, were cracking before the bird could hatch. And, and then trying to investigate why they were cracking, they found it was the DDT, which was the spray which you did on agriculture. The DDT which you sprayed was, was destroying that and having that impact. So that long chain impact, which you didn't know. You know, these impacts are not so obvious and easy. When the vultures started disappearing, and we, there used to be, Pradeep Sahib is here, you would know, there used to be such a common bird here, the minute you had a carcass, uh, within, within 20 minutes, you would have 20, 30 vultures, which would, which would come. That itself was amazing. But they disappeared, and people could not figure out, because nobody kills the vulture, we could not figure out why it was. It was a scientist who, I think, uh, if I'm not right, studied in uh, Pakistan, that it was diclofenic sodium, which, which, uh, which was entering the system through dead cattle. And that, that uh, uh, diclofenic sodium then got accumulated, and, and they, were, they were dying. Now, that sort of link was very, very difficult to do, but what happened was, I think, something like 98% of the vultures uh, uh, just died out in a matter of three or four years. There was a vulture census recently, just two, three days ago, and they couldn't find a single one in Amdavad. But that is the type of impact humans were having. So not all impacts were conscious. Most of the impacts were because of our lifestyles. We did things which, which had that impact. Next one. But really at a, at a United Nations level, the first time when it was really taken cognizance of this environment crisis became 72. So although 62 was when America really woke up, Gandhiji was of course much earlier and many other things were being said. 72 is when that really watershed happened. Um, Palme, who was the Prime Minister of Sweden, invited all heads of government and states from all over the world. Only one accepted and that was the Prime Minister of India. And there was a good, good discussion here should we, should we go or not? Is this a problem of developed world or not? Or is it only developed? Why are we going? But India and the scientists around her and others said that no, this is so critical. And, and she makes at that time this, this um, pairing that the environment cannot be improved in conditions of poverty and also the reverse, that you cannot solve the problems of poverty under an impoverished environment. But that fact that environment and development are two sides of the same coin was something which India can proudly say that we were one of the contributors to that entire different way of looking at environmental issues. So you, you can see that it's coming closer. Um, Silent Spring talked about it, then it's coming closer here. People are seeing that link. Next one. Um, then you had, of course, many, many events. This is one which was rather famous, the Brundtland Commission. She later became the Prime Minister of Norway. Um, the Brundtland Commission talked about our common future and also this whole word sustainable development. What is the word sustainable development? You know, otherwise it was environment and development. Even the next UN conference is environment development. But the word sustainable, sustainability, which you now will find in almost all corporate, all corporate annual reports, will talk about what they do sustainability wise. In fact, sustainability is now a requirement to be put in. But at that time, it was these are very new words. 92 then, 20 years after that 72, was when the first conference, which was called the Earth Summit, Environment and Development. Uh, and I had the privilege of being part of the Indian delegation at that time. 
and we were writing the writing the India report. It was interesting that this is a side story, but interesting that we wrote this report. We took it to Delhi because India. Had, they said, "Can we? You write one as the Center for Advanced Education. We'll we'll take it, but we are not going to present a country report." So I went there. We we had given the report. Uh, the two days later, there was this meeting, and the India report was circulated to everyone. So I was amazed. I said, "How did how did this happen?" And then I opened it. It is our report. So. I then asked the secretary, I said, what happened? He said, I'll tell you later, but we all liked the report so much that we got our pune to, to tear off all the covers and put a new ministry cover on it. So, it, so these things also happened, but it was, I suppose, a, a compliment in some ways. Um, but one of the sentences which we wrote in that was the real challenge of development is not how to get there, but how not to. That a development model which is so strong the Western model is so strong that development is seen that way. And we might, and even now, today, I'll come back to that later, because India is the presidency of the G20. And we are, we are now talking, today that speech by uh, the head of the planning commission, or uh, Niti Ayo, he was mentioning how we have to think of our own directions. But this was said at, at that time, that unless we change the direction of where we are going, it's not a question. There is no possible way in which this development can happen, which if we were to all, all imitate what was, what was said there. Next one. And that was also a very interesting moment when uh, senior President Bush said that the American way of life is not up for negotiation. You know, he, he was not coming to the summit in Rio. And then they had to almost negotiate, okay, please come. So he says, I will come provided you do not mention lifestyles. And there's another slide I'm showing on Earth Charter, that the Earth Charter document is shelved. The Earth Charter document talks about the ethics which have to go along with saving the environment. And he said, let's not discuss any ethics issue. Let's not discuss this. We can discuss pollution. We can discuss other things. But the American way of life is not up for negotiation. I'm saying that twice because it, you will see what happened afterwards. Next one. This is the Earth Charter, which was, as I said, one of his conditions to cancel. Next one. Um, I, I've just said this. Next one. So today we are, we, I'm sort of fast forwarding the whole thing. We are, we are left with these three or four major problems as they are seen. I mean, one is, of course, a pollution of all natures. Pollution of air, pollution of, of water, and more, more recently, right at the prime, is the plastic pollution. It, it is really so bad. And, and if you go not only to towns, but if you go to villages, the packing which is, which is plastic, it's inevitable. You have no place to throw it. Even where you, where you throw it in the right place, you don't, you're not really sure whether the municipality is in taking it and is it going to segregate it or not or what they're doing. Uh, we have, incidentally, in 10 cities now, uh, helped set up enterprises which will take in this plastic and, uh, and recycle it. Uh, but it's a big way. It starts again, as I said, cannot be done by governments unless the person who throws it, throws it in the right bin. So till that time, you cannot do it. Next one. The other one is the tremendous biodiversity loss. And uh, as you must be again reading the paper, the COP15 for biodiversity is just ending uh, yesterday or today. It, was, it is ending. Again, what are the issues? One of the issues is who pays for it? Who pays for this? But India has, in spite of all its pressures of, of, on land and things with having uh, uh, less land proportionally than the number of people, we have done a phenomenal job of saving things which could be saved in uh, sanctuaries and national parks. Uh, the tiger is still here. The Asiatic lion is, is still here. We are now looking for a second home and things like that. But they are still, still around. Uh, where we still have a problem is those species which cannot be put into a sanctuary. They, they go out and other things. How do you preserve, how do you preserve, preserve, preserve those? And these are all interconnected with humans. When you talk about ecology, the ecology, the interconnection between human agriculture and others and the, and the, way, the way the forest is, is very difficult. I mean, Velavadar, if many of you may have seen, it's known as a black buck sanctuary. And it's, it's a wonderful 30 square kilometer, 35 square kilometer um, 
uh, National Park Sanctuary. But besides the black buck, it also happens to be the best place for the harrier. The three harriers which come there migrate and the largest concentration is in Veladar. And if you see the figures, the numbers was going up. So at first you might think that this is success. But then when we found out, it was because all the other places which they went to are, are being destroyed, that they are all coming to Veladar. So now you have this huge concentration from all over which has come to Veladar and they are going out because during the day they don't stay in Veladar. They, they roost in Veladar, they fly out about 12 kilometers and go to farmers' cotton fields and eat the insects there. So they are considered farmers' friend. But those farmers, because of poverty and water, don't use pesticides. So it's all very well, you know, it's, it's, it works, works well. Now the Narmada water is coming there and, and people for development are going to give them pesticides. Now once you give them pesticides, just like the vulture, you will suddenly find that the entire po population crashes. And what do you do now? So the ecology part here, which is the research part, which is what is stressed and I was very glad to see the awards which are being handled. The, the research part, understanding these linkages, is so important because the person who is promoting agriculture has no idea of these birds. And the forest department really doesn't have jurisdiction outside. It cannot go and tell agriculture is what to do. So, so it is civil society, organizations such as GES, which can in fact make those links. Next one. And then of course you have the big one, which is, which is this. In India, luckily we don't have skeptics in that sense. We have people who don't know and we have people who know. In America, you have people who know otherwise. No, in America you have people who, who deny this. In Texas you cannot teach uh, Darwin's theory unless you also teach the creation theory. It is, it is only considered a theory. So, so it is very different. Luckily in India we don't have a problem. And what is very interesting, I should again aside, that in India I, I talk to little children and long, relation, long chain effects that A caused B, B caused C, C caused D, D caused E is very easily understood in India. Our stories are like that. I go and I, one school I went to, I asked uh, why did Ganga uh, put her children in the river? And who knows? And every child raised their hand. They know the Mahabharat enough. And in the Mahabharat, to understand why Ganga did that action, was she cruel? Was she, was she I mean, absurd? What was, what was wrong with her? But why did she do that is such a long story. And that long story is understood by people. So then when you come to the environment and saying that when you do agriculture here, this happens, that happens, and there is a long chain, people understand it much more. So climate change is perhaps now considered one of the biggest ones, but they are all linked. You cannot have the climate change one, biodiversity and pollution. These are the three focal areas for what we really need to do. And this is, of course, um, uh, a slide which shows that we are currently consuming or we are going towards consuming two and a half planets uh, while we need to follow that orange line. We are already at one and a half or more. And how we have to change that. Next one, quickly. Uh, the ecological footprint tells you how much you tread on it. Next one. And uh, if you see this, this is how much the ecological footprints of different countries are. If you see Asia with a very large um, x-axis, uh, was not, and if Asia were to follow the West, this is what would happen. Just, just go back one slide. Yeah. So this is, this is what it is today. Now, if if everyone in that green wants a li lifestyle like North North America, then the total effect would be this. Which which you can any any small child. I've done this, not with slides but with other other techniques. I've done it with rural schools in Gujarat. And everyone understands. Okay, this this is this is not a path we can follow. It's not a question of when we will follow it. There is never going to be a time when Baroda will look like uh, 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 Los Angeles or something. It cannot, because it would be a disaster if it if it did. There might be a time when Los Angeles looks like Baroda. That that might be that might be something which we have to aspire to, but not the other way around, because we are we have to be confident of taking different decisions. So what was that sustainable development? This is what got at that time when this start from is not defined, but then India defined this sustainable development. And, and uh, 
we were asked to coordinate between Indian ministries and our uh, uh, people who were arguing the case there. Next. So it is, it is to do with this um, consumption. This is a one week consumption of an average size family. No, nobody is fatter than the other. But, but the consumption is very different because of packaging. Be it is essential, the, the fact that we have processed packaged goods, probably unhealthy also. So the left hand side is more expensive, more wasteful, environmentally a disaster, and health wise a disaster, and uh, more costly. And then these people, but these people still aspire to be like that. This is, the, this is the problem. We aspire, our aspirations are in that direction. And that, that's where our heads need to be uh, examined a bit. Uh, next. Uh, then we had the, uh, I mean, I have several things I'm omitting in between, but then we had the Paris uh, COP in 2015. And at the Paris COP, finally, all these countries at least came to an agreement. They are not following it, but at least they, they came to an agreement that we have to do something so that the temperature doesn't go up below 1.5 degrees. We are already up to 1.1. It does not go more. That is where we finally, through the Indian delegation, saw that in the preamble, it says also recognizing the sustainable lifestyles and sustainable patterns of consumption and production with developed countries taking the lead play an important role in addressing climate change. Now, you might say, what's so great about this sentence? But this sentence has to be seen with that comment of Bush in 92. At that time, America was so powerful that America could say, see to it that the word lifestyle does not enter into any negotiation till 2015 when the Prime Minister and the whole thing saw that it has to be there. And it is the Indian delegation which ensured this. What he also did was that he, he asked CE to prepare a book called Parampara, India's Traditions of Climate Friendly Traditions. You know, what are, what are India's climate friendly traditions? And you find many. And we, we will discover if each one of you I ask, you will all have a new one to add to this book. Next one. So the Prime Minister launched this book in, um, in Paris that time. And again, put in that uh, we developed country parties taking the lead. Now here, play an important role in addressing climate change. The Rio had already said common but differentiated responsibilities. Now we are going into this whole concept of what is fair and what is just. That the responsibility of solving this, yes, it's common. It's everyone's, but differentiated in the sense we expect the West, who has already done this, to do much more than India does. Uh, India always mentions, rightly I think, climate change and the effect on in a per capita basis. Per person, this is what we do. They mention it as an aggregate. So India looks like the third most polluting country in the world. You know, it, it looks like that. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a slight of stat any statisticians here will know how you can handle statistics in any way you like. So it comes out differently. But we found when we were doing it all sorts of things. For instance, our young architect team from Ahmedabad went to, uh, went to Kashmir. And in Kashmir, they were, they were looking at these houses. And underneath each house is the place where they keep their, their goats. So we are asking, why? What is this? Why is that? We will say, see, garmi should not go waste. So that the, the, the living room is kept warm because of the goats who are under, under the thing. I mean, just think of these are old concepts which, which work. Next one. And then we have simple things. Children ask me, what should we do? I said, you eat mangoes. Next one. You eat mangoes in, in season. Now in Gujarat, everyone does eat mangoes in season, more or less after, after the monsoon. Children stop asking, give me I want mangoes. If you go to Bombay, maybe 50% of the children will say, why can't I have a mango? In New York, they don't even know that seasons exist. Because, no, they don't, because it's gone out. The supermarket is supposed to find the source and bring it. So you have situations like, like on the right hand side here, that they will be flown in and everything else. You can. You can get them from Mauritius for certain months. You can get them from Kenya and other months. Uh, and, uh, and, and what happens? The footprint of something which we eat goes up. Now, you ask children in Kerala, when I talk, I show them the bananas. And, and they see different type of bananas. And I said, would you like just one type or something? They say, no. Next one. So, Rotli, so what's so great about this? Next one. So we had this whole concept of a khakra. Now khakra, what is a khakra? It is, it is something where you, you don't want to throw away the extra rotlis. Now of course khakra itself is a product. So that is a different issue, you know. 
Lijat and so many others are making khakra. But at that time, khakra was just a way of preserving it without electricity. It was just, it was a simple thing. Uh, people ask me, solar energy, does India use solar energy? So I said, these are examples of what I call Sida solar, which is, which is that all mirchi in India is dried by solar energy. Solar energy doesn't mean I have to put a big uh, PV cell and then bring up a thing and then uh, have a heater and someone IIT has designed it. So this is also solar energy. So, so let us know what, what this is. Next sir. When I first came to India, uh, I was given a communication job of, of this. And it, interestingly, talking about research, so the research people used to calculate how much protein is there in dal, and you write it down. How much protein is there in rice, you write it down. You add the two, and it is not as good as milk or something else. Huh? So it looks low. Then some brilliant mind said that, how about looking at it together? So they saw that if you cook, and if you cook it together and eat it, then, um, then, then the absorbability, because of the rice, of the protein mm. increases and it becomes as good as two glasses mm. of milk. Okay? Uh, so the great finding, the result is that you should eat dal and chawal together. Now, of course, we've known it for some time that dal and chawal uh, should be eaten together. But this was the research. That when you start doing research with a different mind frame, that you, you keep everything separate and don't see synergy, you come to the wrong, wrong results. Next one. Uh, now, very quickly, the few more things. The Constitution of India is again unique in the fact that it is the duty of every citizen of India to protect and improve the natural environment, including forests, lakes, and things. So MC Mehta, a friend and a lawyer, he took a public interest litigation. And he said, how can, I, how can you ask a citizen to protect the environment when you don't teach it? So the Supreme Court gave a judgment, first in 92 and then again in 2003, which said that every school, college, formal education program has to have environmental education in it because of this. In the second one, they even said that we will put the minister in charge of education at the state level in jail if they don't do it. That is, that is the seriousness with which they say. India became the first country where, where, where this is done. And that generation is now coming out. So a lot of people are asking me, that generation which has now grown up with at least knowing the environment in the school, are they going to be different from the film? We don't know, but we hope so. Next one, quickly. Uh, we did a lot of things to also create public awareness. One was the climate change train. Next one. And uh, you know, there were, there were communication challenges. How do you tell uh, someone that 1.5 degrees we are all arguing about? They say, you know, so what is the 1.5? You know, I mean, winter, summer, morning, evening, 1.5 is nothing. And that also, they are talking, they are talking Celsius. Uh, so I said, what do, how do we communicate this? So we said, okay, how many of you have had a fever? So everyone raises their, their hand. And that is probably 1.5 degrees Fahrenheit, not even Celsius. And I said, can you come to school? They said, no, we can't. So just to explain to them an average systemic temperature rise as different from, a, from an external rise and how that has a completely different effect. We also had a school program in Andhra where these little girls started using this. And we said, what is this? They said, it's a handprint. What is handprint? Handprint is what we can do. They are saying that if you just tread on the planet, yes, you are calling it the footprint, discovered by some Swiss engineers. Handprint is discovered by us in India. So we put it out in 2007 as a launch. Today, there are at least 20, 30 countries in the world which we are doing. There is a German uh, uh, website on handprint. Uh, uh, Time magazine covered it as one of the 10 best ideas. Of course, they gave credit to Harvard, but uh, now people are very upset. They said, why, what is this Harvard? How did Harvard come in? So we phoned that Harvard person. That Harvard person, I never saw it. The journalist asked me, so I said, this is a good thing. And we did it. But anyway, that's a, I said, credits you have to forget here in this country. Next. Next one. Next. We also had this whole thing that how do you have uniform things in India which, uh, which go all over India. How do I develop an educational material which will work in Kanyakumari, will work in Sundarbans, will work in Kashmir? How do you do it? And so we said we'll take inspiration from the Indian sari. The sari is a highly designed garment. A patola sari might take two years to make. 
and yet the final product is the result of the wearer and the person who designed that garment. So it is not a standard, it doesn't come with a prescription. And so our educational materials will be like that. They empower the teacher, but it's the teacher who wears the sari or wears that educational material and, and uses it. Next one. Uh, and of course, we have to talk about adaptation and mitigation. We don't realize that for most people, most villages in India, there's only so much they can do for mitigation. They have to prepare. And again, GEC, GES will be required because the coastal villages are the most uh, difficult ones to handle. Next one. Uh, this, is, this is again coming up. The urban population is bound to go up. And again, under the G20, there was a discussion in Delhi, in Bombay yesterday day before and what should that urbanization be and are we going to think differently uh, Abdul Kalam ji for instance who we saw a photo with uh, with Asmubai uh, Abdul Kalam used to talk about Pura which was the how do you provide urban services to rural areas at that time we didn't have this COVID ease with which we can work in, in long distance today we do so today do we want an urban strategy which is totally different let let uh, Anand and Valsad, all, do we focus on these and really bring them up to a certain level or do we continue to let everyone migrate to the bigger cities of Surat and Ahmedabad and Baroda and things and, and then trying to solve the problem. It's again that same issue of leapfrogging. Do we think differently or we don't? Next one. Circular economy, I've, I've spoken about it from nature you learn. This is another whole story I won't have time today to do. Next one. We are doing some work in Surat just now uh, as a textile hub. How to, how to make a textile uh, thing. Next one. Uh, and this is the project which uh, we have launched, uh, Prime Minister launched at uh, COP26, which is this thing called LIFE, life. The I is actually small, and it is lifestyle for environment. So the whole cycle of lifestyles, which was then introduced in 2015, now is becoming central part of the government of India's, India's strategy to go to people. Next one. Uh, just one example of what lifestyle means, in, in Japan, for instance, they decided that if they were to all give up their tie and give up their coat, they could increase the temperature of their air conditioners. Okay? It was a very small idea. The Prime Minister went on TV telling people to do this and in front of Jap Japan, as you must know, is a very formal society. They all wear ties and suits and things. He took it off and he said, this is the way. You now have stores, cool biz stores in, in Japan. How do you design formal clothes without the tie and the jacket? And all the air conditioners have been set at 28, 28 degrees. And it is, there is a whole chart which will show you how many tons of carbon this one act of lifestyle change has done in Japan. So it is, it is possible to do it and it's possible through leadership. Next one. So that's, that's all I had to say, to say that it is a, it's something which we need to bring people together. And as I said, Hasmukh Bhai showed it in his own way that he, he was familiar and could work in all these three things. And then, of course, the research angle, which is so much required here. And research not only at the high end, maybe next year you can announce one for school children also who do, uh, who do some of the outstanding research because it's not only at the hand they need to get into a mentality of trying to find out. And um, we hope that in his memory, we will all be able to do justice to those dreams and really take India, Gujarat and our cities forward. Thank you very much.